Great. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, now for the last part of this uh, short lecture series. So in part two, we just finished proving this um, beautiful theorem by Anne Lesbeth Smith, Hoxie Kimiki, Mashweed, um, and Murayama in the setting of um, characteristic P. And the main point to prove this theorem was to, well, to prove it in characteristic P as Hox and Hume did, the main point was to cleverly use tight closure techniques and to use the pigeonhole principle. So um, we use tight closure because it's easier to prove that something is in the tight closure of the power than it is to prove that it is on this power. Um, and then our ring was regular, so ideals were tightly closed. Um, the pigeonhole principle really gave us this containment when I take um, not an EN, but when I take a power P. And remember, the idea was that you uh, reduce to the local setting and realize that you really just want to prove something about an ideal generated by each element. And you want to see which Frobenius power does the, the H cube power we live in. And we noted that we could do this sort of slightly better containment by sort of using this, the, all the, the, the full power of the pigeonhole principle. Um, now, I want to point out that if you follow the exact same proof we did, but sort of apply the pigeonhole principle k times, so I take some k that's at least zero. So when k is zero, this is exactly the same that I just showed you, right? The, the first symbolic power is i. Um, so there's just a kind of souped up version you can do by kind of repeatedly applying the pigeonhole principle to kind of keep getting things in the Frobenius power. So you kind of will, in the local setting, this thing will turn into a power. And you know, it's essentially the same proof. If you want to do it carefully, I'd recommend first go over what we did today and try to do it on your own first. Um, right, reduce to the local setting, see what it is that you want to prove, try to apply the based on whole principle. And then you can look at my notes where there is a complete proof of this statement. But I want to write it out because um, this is going to be important in this second half. So I want to talk about um, how, do, how do we, one can improve this theorem. And there are many ways to, to sort of go, right? One could think about non-regular rings and there's lots I had planned to comment on um, about that that we might not have time for. If we do have time, I'll, I'll do it at the end of this lecture. If not, um, you can take a look at the notes. Or remember, there's this much, much longer version, 200 pages in my website that, that you can look at. But I want to stay in the setting of regular rings instead. And I want to talk about whether um, we can try, write tighter containment. So remember, my goal was give an eye I want to find and a power, I want to find the best possible symbolic power I can put in there. And we prove a, a positive statement, we prove a certain containment holds. We did not say that was best possible. So um, let's look at some examples. On Monday, we thought about this square free monomial ideal and three variables. So here K is a field. Well, this theorem. Well, what is the big height here? Remember, we wrote down a primary decomposition for this radical ideal. All the minimal primes, all these are primes of height two. So the big height is two. So the theorem says the two n symbolic power is contained in the n power for all n. So for example, it says the fourth symbolic power is contained in the square. Okay. Can we do better? Last time, well, okay, two times ago on Monday in lecture one, we saw that the second symbolic power is different and thus not contained in the square. So if you could do better, the only other possibility would be to consider the third symbolic power, right? I already know four works and two doesn't, three is what's left. And you can check this. This is an easy exercise um, that the third symbolic power is contained in the square. So sometimes you can do better. Um, you can even do better for prime ideals. So for primes, this big height is just a height. And so, for example, 
if you just look at the prime P that defines the curve, T to the fourth, T to the fifth, four, uh, three, four, five. So I really mean like the kernel of the map. So it's the prime and three variables that defines this curve, right? So if you like, it's the kernel of the map to KT that sends each variable to one of these powers. That's, that's what I mean by this. Uh, well, it's a really cool exercise to prove that the second symbolic power of this P is not the square. Um, and I wish I had time to do it. It's one of my favorite examples to do. Um, never seen it, think about it, or, or, or look at, look at my, my, my longer notes. You'll see, you'll see this sent carefully. But anyway, this is a prime of hype two, right? It defines a curve in three-dimensional space. Um, and so the theorem again says the two n symbolic power is contain the n power for all n. And so in particular, again, the fourth symbolic power is contained in the square. It's a cool exercise to prove the second symbolic power is not contained in the square, it's different. But once again, you can improve this a little bit and write three instead of four. So when Craig Unicke first heard, so before he and uh, Mel Hoxer had done that proof we just covered, when he heard of Ein Lazarsfeld and Smith's work, this is the very first question he asked. Well, first he was surprised. It was a truly wonderful, uh, surprising result. And then he said, well, you know what? I cannot find any prime of high two in a regular local ring for which I can't get the third symbolic power. Not only couldn't we find it, <laughs> nobody has found such a prime uh, in the 22 years since he asked this question. Um, and despite, despite what I'm going to say next, spoiler alert. Um, and there are good reasons to think about this. So let's see, this is a situation where our big height is two. And there are some things we have we have seen that are better than 2n containing n, right? We proved in prime care this P, you can do better. So in fact, Harborn asked um, a few years later a very reasonable question. Now I'm back to the setting of any radical ideal. Okay, I, I should be um, careful here. His original question was for homogeneous ideals in, in, in polynomial rings. Um, so I'm kind of restating it slightly here. Um, but I think it, it makes sense to consider this, this generality. So if I have a radical ideal of big I H in a regular ring, regular ring, um, can I take the statement from that nice theorem? And could I possibly always improve it by subtracting h minus one? So remember, Oxford and Hunicke told us this is true if you take a power of p in characteristic p, right? In fact, the pigeonhole principle told us that. It would sort of, it, it's, it's, it, it's sort of a very fundamental elementary fact. So it seems extremely reasonable that you should be able to do this for all. So in particular notice that when you're in prime characteristic two, you get this containment of the third symbolic power in the square for big high two automatically, right? That's, that's what this, this says when you take um, P equal to two and N equal to two. The thing that is strange and sometimes mathematics is, is very bizarre. The thing that is truly shocking um, is that there are radical ideals that don't satisfy this conjecture problems. So 
The first count example was signed by Dumnitsky, Schumberg, and Tygazinska. There's three algebraic geometers um, from Poland. They're sort of experts on, on point configurations. So what they did was they found a very explicit configuration of points, of 12 points in D2. Um, that fail was continuing. I'm very bad at drawing, and I forgot to prepare a drawing beforehand. So if you want to see a picture of this special configuration of 12 points in D2, um, please look in the notes. If uh, you're more algebraic, maybe I can write down what it is because it, it looks very simple. But I'm actually going to write not just the original counterexample, but I'm going to write a generalization of it by Harborn and Sicilian. So the first current example was published in 2013, and this is a paper, uh, paper from 2015. And I'm going to be over some fields of characteristic not to. <laughs> Because it's going to be a kind of example to place about carbon square, which is true in characteristic two. Um, I'm going to fix the number n to be at least three. Oh, maybe it shouldn't be called n, but I'm really bad with letters. C, maybe. And it's x, y to the c minus c to the c, y to the c minus x to the c, z, x to the c minus z. We're going to take c to be three. Um, this gives you 12 points. This is in general some special configuration of points in, in D2. So this is a radical ideal. It defines, as I just said, some points in D2. So that has big height too. And um, It fails the third symbolic power in this thing. So somehow the, the magical thing in here is that somehow, even though we have this containment, so by the way, they did this originally over C, but then Harvard and Sicilian prove you can do this over any field. You've got to be careful about what field you pick. So notice that you know somehow. Even though for, for powers of your characteristic, you're going to get this containment. That's somehow not sufficient to get the containment for all the other ends. It doesn't force it to be true for all the other ends. If you go back and you, you look at our proof, you know, our tight closure proof in the Hoxer and Hineke theorem, we didn't use this more powerful version of the pigeonhole principle. But if you try to put it in there, you'll see that there's a true obstacle. Like it, it, you can't just, you know, it shouldn't work, right? Because otherwise this thing wouldn't be a kind of example. But it really, it really doesn't work in sort of a sad, sad way. But in my opinion, it just kind of makes the story more exciting. Now I will say that despite the fact that now there are other families of kind of examples. All of them are so sort of very special. You kind of have to take some special configuration of points or, or, or hyperplanes or whatever in, in some really, really special way. And um, in some sense, I want to convince you that actually many ideals do satisfy this, this conjecture. And we're going to prove that a large class of ideals in characteristic P do satisfy this conjecture for all n, not just for powers of P. Um, so maybe let me start by saying that Harborn's conjecture holds for various things. Let me list some, and then we'll, we'll prove, um, we'll think about a large class. It's, that, it's satisfied by monomial ideals. I added the word square free that is not necessary. But I added in because for us, all ideals are radical. So I should say square three. Um, it's satisfied by generic sets of points in P2 and P3. So P2 is a result of Bocci and Harborn. P3 is a result of Dominici. 
it's likely to impede. And this is no proof. These proofs sort of rely on geometric things that are special in these dimensions. It's true for some special configurations, like things like matroid configurations, star configurations. So sort of for certain special nice things, it's all prevalent. And today we're going to prove what I think of as a generalization of this monomial case. So um, this is sort of a philosophy that I learned from uh, Luis Nunez Petancourt. Whenever you see a theorem that is true for monomial ideals, ask yourself, hmm, is this true for ideals defining f theorems? Because I want to say most of the time, <laughs> now this is me talking, most of the time, it ends up being that there's a version of that theorem uh, that makes sense for all ideals defining f theorems has a large class of ideals in character CP, and it contains the class of spur-free monomial ideals. Now, I believe you've seen up your, um, up your rings a little bit in these lectures, but again, it's kind of the end, we're all tired, so I'm gonna just give us a quick reminder, but I'm going to cheat. I'm going to first tell us what is an F-split ring. Well, a ring is, uh, of character CP is F-split, it's Frobenius splits, right? That's what the name says. So the Frobenius map, you can think about it as a map of our modules. I don't know what notations you've been using before, but I'm writing this to mean the R module that has underlying um, Billion group R, but the R module structure is given by the Frobenius map. So this is Frobenius. And, um, but for being used to split, that means that there's a map of our modules beta um, that it gives a splitting for this. So beta f should be the identity. So when r is f finite, so I guess maybe let me put it like this. So today, so that I don't accidentally say something uh, funky, all rings are f finite for the rest of my lectures. So remember that means for Venus, um, makes R into a, a finitely generated module. This f over star R is finitely generated. So that setting, f split is the same thing as f pure. Um, you've probably seen the proper definition of f pure. It means the Frobenius map is pure. I'm not going to write it carefully because I think it's easier. If you're not comfortable with these things, it's easier to think about the splitting. But I'm actually not going to use a definition at all <laughs> because I'm going to think about this condition in terms of a criterion by Feder. So theorem, that I think you've seen several times, but I want to remind you because it's so important. Feder's criterion, um, was proved by Richard Feder as part of his thesis. Um, this is Suna Melhopster, and this is in his thesis in 1983. So if I have a regular local ring and a prime characteristic, I'm going to be lazy and strike these because I'm zero. Let me take some radical ideas. The quotient is F pure. So F splits. Um, if and only if. When you look at your ideal I and you ask who sends you into a Frobenius tunnel, you want this colon ideal, so the things that send I into the Frobenius power, to be pretty big. So you want it to not be contained in the Frobenius power of N. And you can take this for all or some. This is a typical thing too. So you can rewrite this with just P if you like. And now you have a very computable statement. Right? You could put this in Macaulay, for example, compute the colon ideal and decide, oops, whether you're not, <laughs> sorry, whether you are not in the previous hour of the ideal. So I think, again, I think of this statement as a measure of largeness, right? This is saying this colon is really big. I will say, you know, this also works 
if you take a polynomial ring of our fields, um, you know, you grade it and you take a homogeneous ideal instead, this also applies, right? So I said my ring was regular, local, but you could also take this grade of seven. So in particular, wink, wink, it is okay to use this in the graded setting in the, in the problems that you're working on. So in unrelated news, um, one thing you will prove is that um, if I is a square free monomial ideal, then our mod I is FQR. So that's, that's an example of such a thing. These guys are contained in ideals that define FQ rings, by which I mean when I create a quotient by them, I get an FQ ring. So this is a small, somehow square free monomial ideals are a small subclass inside of the world of um, FQ rings. So for example, the Veronese rings, well, the Veronese subrings of polynomial rings, the Veronese subrings of other FQ rings, they're all FQ rings. If you take a generic determinantal ring, these are all FQ. More generally, if you take sort of a nice string of invariants, um, you also get an FQ ring. So this is to say, this is a nice, interesting class of singularities. These, these rings that are FQ are they sort of have mild enough singularities that you have some control over them, but it's also a really large class, but it includes lots of classical rings that you would want to be interested in. So what we're going to prove is that we're going to prove, um, so we'll show, is that our mod I is pure. Okay, I might as well write the theorem now, and then I'll just move it to the next stage. Theorem. This is the theorem of myself with Fred Unity. Published officially in twenty nineteen. I guess I should say that ours regular. It has here to stick P. It needs to be a finite. I is radical of big height H. And if our mod I has nice singularities, if it is F pure, then it satisfies our bonus conjecture. Well, let me copy paste this to the next page. But before I write a proof for the theorem, I'm going to give you an idea of what it is that we're going to do. So I want to motivate the, the proof. Because um, I think this is a, a sort of technique that is, is um, helpful in other things. What we want to do is we want to prove some containment of ideas. So we talked a little bit about proving containment. We said that proving a containment is a local statement. So in particular, that's going to help, right? Because this, this condition of purity is something that localizes well, so we can easily reduce the problem. Actually, let me, let me add that here already. Prove kind of the first step is reduced to the local space. How do you do that? This localizes. Proving containment is something it's sufficient to do after you localize. So um, you, can, you can start by doing that. So, I mean, it's sufficient to prove the setting where you're in this level. Um, but in a different idea, if you ever want to prove an ideal is containing a number, you can sort of measure the failure of that containment by studying the colon ideal that corresponds to the containment. So this is the same as showing, is this. So proving that an ideal is contained in another is the same as showing that the things that send I into J contain one. 
So it's the same as showing that this colon ideal, oops, <laughs> well, it's always containment, but it's the same as showing that this colon is R. What does it mean for an ideal to be R? Well, it means it's very, very big. It's as large as an ideal can possibly be. How do you show, so if R is local, so maybe let me say R n, even though we, you would have guessed that's what I meant. If I take a local ring and I wanna show some ideal is not R, this is equivalent to showing that M is not contained, sorry, that this guy is not contained in M. You are so big that you're not contained in the largest possible ideal. So to prove a containment, it's sufficient to prove that this colon ideal is not contained in M. And in fact, you know, in characteristic E, you can even take Frobenius powers. Frobenius powers should preserve containment. So it's sufficient to prove that the, the Frobenius power of your colon ideal is not contained in the Frobenius power of the maximum. You know, whatever this I and J are, this is a strategy that would always work to prove the containment. What do I have at my disposal? I want to prove a theorem or I'm assuming that I have an ideal that defines an theorem. The Spanish criterion gives me a fantastic um, ideal to look at that somehow, you know, is too big, right? That is not contained in M to the Frobenius Q. So what you could do is, you know, if I guess now this I is not the same I, but whatever. If R mod I is the pure, okay, maybe I need a different letter. Let me call this I everywhere, A. Suppose that I know that R mod I is the pure. All I need to show Is that that, cool, that special colon, I for me is QI, is contained in this special colon I want to study. Why? Because this guy is not contained right, by Fetter. Fetter tells me the special colon is not in the Frobenius power in the maximum deal. But if I have shown that this guy is contained in here, you know, that forces this bigger thing not to be contained in the Frobenius power, right? Because if this thing was contained in the Frobenius power, so would the other thing be. So in general, you, you want to prove some containment. And you have access to some special ideal that you know defines an F-pure ring. If you somehow prove that this special colon is contained in the Frobenius power of the colon that has that comes from the containment you want to prove, then that's what you do, then you're done. So in my special case, I want to prove this containment. I really want to prove this implication. This is the one thing we couldn't do if we were in person somewhere, right? So to prove this, to show this, what you're going to show is that kind of independently of this purity condition, you're going to show that the special contain colon ideal is always contained in the colon well, the Frobenius power of the colon of the single. And then that will say, so we'll say this always for large Q. And if I prove this, and by this always, I mean no conditions on I, right? Give me a radical ideal I, big high H, I'm gonna prove such a containment always holds. And this is going to force that when R mod I isn't pure, this guy is too big to be contained in that Frobenius power of the maximum ideal. So this guy is not in the Frobenius power of the maximum ideal. And then you trace back through this, and you're gonna find that this colon is all of R. And so the containment you want to prove is true.
Does the strategy make sense? Are there questions about the strategy? Okay, now I'm going to do something evil. <laughs> I'm going to do not this. The thing I just described is what we prove in our paper. I'm going to give you a better version of the theorem, which is what we should have written in our paper, but it was not what is written there, uh, because I'm going to prove something a little stronger. But it's the exact same technique, the exact same idea. So I will show. Copy. So, so now I have RM local. And I will show the following. Well, in principle, I would show this, but I'm going to change it a little. I want to change it. I'm going to prove it slightly different container. So I'm going to prove. Okay, whatever this is, this implies the following. So suppose I show this containment that I'm claiming, right? Maybe let me call this claim. This is what I'm going to show. This implies that if R mod I is a pure, this is going to give me the containment N plus H contained in I, I N. Because okay. remember the strategy, when R mod I is a pure, this thing is not contained in the Frobenius power of the maximum ideal. So this thing cannot be contained in the Frobenius power of the maximum ideal. So the containment corresponding to this holds. So when R mod I is a pure, this is the containment I will show. And somehow, this, from this containment, we will obtain the, the big theorem of time three. Uh, so I should make a decision now. What do I want to do first? OK, let me first tell you, let's believe the claim. OK, so the claim gives this containment. Let's prove the theorem from this containment. OK, so I have, so if I n plus h is contained in i, i n, I want to show you that Harborn's conjecture is true. Right here. Okay. So how do I do this? And what does this even mean? This looks strange, right? I think of the statement as saying the following. Each time you take your symbolic power and you raise the order a little bit, you raise the order by h. That kind of gains you an extra power. Of I. Okay. So each more, the more copies of H you have in your, the order of your symbolic power, the higher power you're going to land on. This is kind of what Ein Lesfeld's metatoxic human key must be blah, 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 told us, right? But this is um, stronger, I claim. Because now, if you want to consider, this is the, the symbolic power involved in Harborn's conjecture, right? The one that somehow, should end up in I to the N at the end of the story. If I go from here, you know, you can even think of this as kind of like H appears N minus one many times. Okay. Each time I subtract an H, so for example, I could write H times N minus two. So I subtracted an H, right? I went from this guy to this guy, and I gain a power of I. Okay, so I'm literally applying this statement. It's bad that I'm using the letters N and both, right? But I'm applying this statement with like, I don't know, this N here is actually what I'm calling here. Um, H N minus two. That's fine. But the idea is each time you lower this guy by H, which is what I did from here to there, I lower the power by h. I gain a power by. And now I'm going to repeat this. And you keep doing this. You keep subtracting. For as long as this makes sense, you can keep subtracting h from it. So notice that throughout the process, the sum of this number and this number are going to remain constant at n minus 1, right? Here I have 0. There's no power of i appearing. And I have an n minus 1 here. And then I have n minus 2, 1 which also sums to n minus one. And then you keep doing this, right? Like the next term would be 
h n minus three plus one i squared. And then I keep doing this. Okay. It's kind of an induction, but it's an induction that stops. Where does it stop? Well, when you get to the end, you've subtracted h as many times as you could, you get this one left, right? Because you had like a multiple of h plus one. And then, so I guess this is like h times zero. And that plus whatever I write here should add up to n minus one. But now the first symbolic power is, is i, and so this is just i to the n, which is where I want it to land. That was already written up there. So kind of the point is that from here, this sort of gives you a simple induction that goes all the way from this guy to i to the n as you want it. And this is actually a stronger statement than the one, than just proving hard ones from actually. This is actually more powerful uh, and I may or may not have time to tell you why. But let me actually prove the claim, right? This all only makes sense if I prove this claim, so let me prove the claim. So I will prove this awful looking thing, but I promise it's actually not awful. So to prove this, um, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to take an element S in here, and then I'll prove that it lives in here. Okay, easy enough. You are going to prove in your problem set that Frobenius powers commute with Holmes. So this is, so I can I can move the Frobenius to inside the colon. So on this side of the colon, I have I n plus H. On this side, since Frobenius power commute commutes with products, this is I Frobenius Q. I to the n to the t. Oh, and here it says the Frobenius, right? So what I did was I applied Frobenius on both sides instead of having the Frobenius outside of the colon. This is a, this is only true because my ring is regular, right? This is what you're going to prove in your problem set. So hence the regularity is, is necessary here. In fact, I think I added a problem to prove that, that to prove that the regularity is necessary. Okay, so somehow I want to start with an S in this colon and land in this god awful, horrible looking thing. Wow. What does it mean to live in this horrible colon? Well, to live in a colon ideal means that you take the thing on the right inside of the thing on the left. Right? So I really want to show that S times I n plus H to the Q. Is contained in that mess on the other side. That's my goal. That's what I'm going to do. And all I know about S is that it sends I into I for Venus. So let's start. I start off, I'm going to write a string of inequality of containment that lead to where I want to be. I start here. Along the way, I'm going to make a, a a lot of steps that seem wasteful. This is the most wasteful of all the steps. I'm going to replace the Frobenius power by the ordinary power. Okay. So the Frobenius power is contained in the Q power. And then I'm going to take that ordinary power. OK, I'll write it out. This is the ordinary power first. So now that means I'm going to break that ordinary power into two pieces. One of them. We'll get Q minus one. And the other one will get just one power of the symbolic power. But now I'm going to do another really wasteful thing. I'm going to remember that a symbolic power is contained in I itself. So this is seems like the most wasteful step of all times. But somehow I claim that at the end of the day, even though we were very wasteful, we're going to end up with the best possible statement we could have had. So it's kind of kind of magical. Okay, so so far I just replaced the Frobenius power by an ordinary power, took one power out, and then remembered the symbolic powers containing the ordinary in the ideal itself. Okay, what did I know about S? S, remember, is something that sends i into the Frobenius power. 
So when I do S times I, I land inside the Fermi cell. So, so far I started on the left and I haven't gotten here yet, but this is where I'm at. And now we compare where you want to go with what you have. And I'm halfway there, <laughs> right? I want to land in a product of two things and I got one of them down. So I'm going to keep that put and I'm going to focus on the other part. So I actually want to show that what's left here, n plus h to the q minus one, I'm going to show that that is contained in, uh, I want to show that it's contained in here. So I'm going to show that it's contained in i to the n the That's where I'm going. That's my goal. And remember, I'm really trying to show this horrible looking thing. So far, I've only done a very silly steps, right? I took Fermi's power, replaced with the power, reorganized stuff, used the, the definition of our S lens. That's all I've done. So now I, I have nothing to do with that S, I have nothing to do with that com complicated stuff. I just want to prove this new Still a horrible looking thing, but maybe not as horrible looking now, right? It's a little sl slightly less confusing. So first step. So now again, I want a string of uh, containments. I'm going to do something I've done today, which is remember that, that when you take a product of symbolic powers, it lands in the symbolic power of the sum of the orders, right? So this guy lives inside u minus one and plus eight. That's where this lands on. And now I want to somehow um, go land in here into the symbolic power. In the beginning of this final part, I wrote down a lemma that I claim was going to be helpful. And this is when it's going to be helpful. I'm going to get it back. Okay, I'm not going to get all of it. I'm going to get this. So remember, I said this is just a pigeonhole principle again and just used in a fancier looking way. So recall, I have this. So let me even put it in a different color or something. Color, this is a recall from earlier. I'm going to apply this thing in today. What am I going to do? Um, I somehow want to land in here. That's my goal. And this is a Fermi's power of the symbolic power. So it looks like this, right? So let me apply this statement, right? On the other side, I just have a symbolic power, which is awesome. So I'm gonna apply this, apply, oops, apply with, K equals what? Where? Well, I want this side to be this side, right? So I want K plus one to be N. So I want K to be N minus one. So I'm gonna copy what's in here and put an N minus one. I H Q plus N minus one Q minus H plus one, my God. So that theorem from before guarantees, maybe let me put it in a box or something. Okay, the theorem from before, somehow, that was just a given whole principle, guarantees this containment hold. I want to prove this funky thing lives in the symbolic power. I've already shown the left-hand side lives in this other symbolic power. If I somehow prove that this symbolic power lives in this symbolic power, then I'm, I can complete the dots, right? I can go here, 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 here and then I'm done, right? That's what I want. So it's sufficient to show, somehow I wanna show that inside of here lives that other symbolic power I have, that lives the Q minus one, H minus one symbol. If I prove that, I connect all the dots and I go from here to there and we've already reduced the problem to this. But now look at the amazing thing. I have a containment of two symbolic powers. Note. 
there should be well, many persons. I, go ahead. Yes, uh, there shouldn't be n plus h, right? n plus h. Where should there be? Oh, down here. Which one is one? I see it. I see it. Thank you so much. You mean I miscopied this thing over here? It's q minus one times n plus h. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Any more comments or questions? Good. We're almost there. So, when is the containment of symbolic powers true? This one is easy, right? It's just they're both symbolic powers. It's like taking two powers. This is saying A is bigger or equal than B. Well, duh. What do I want to prove? I want to prove a symbolic power is in another symbolic power. So, I want to show that H, oh, sorry, Q minus one times n plus h is bigger or equal than h q plus n minus one q minus h plus one. It looks awful, but I've reduced the problem to an inequality of integers, right? It, it can't get any easier than this. I have an inequality of integers. I just want to prove it's true. But remember, I don't need this for all q. I made a claim earlier. I actually only need this for Q large because what I'm going to apply, remember, is Fetter's criterion and Fetter's criterion just, just needs large enough Q to work. So I'm actually going to show not that this inequality always holds because it doesn't always hold, but that it holds for all Q very large. And once you have an inequality involving integers where all that matters is that a particular integer be really big, it's actually sufficient to focus on the coefficients on that very big thing. So we're going to look on both sides of the inequality and read the coefficients of Q. On this side, I have n plus h. On the other side, I have h and n minus 1. I need the coefficients on the left to be bigger than the coefficients on the left. Because the point is I'm gonna make Q to be really big, right? So when Q is really big, the terms involving Q are going to win against the rest because the rest is not going to change, it's constant. Or if you like, another way to think about this is you can take the inequality and divide by Q and it's going to hold uh, whenever the, you know, the parts that you, you didn't have Qs on, now I divide it by Q, Q is going to infinity, so that those pieces become zero. So only the things that had a coefficient of Q are going to matter when you send, send Q to infinity. And so you can see here very explicitly that this is extremely tight. You can't do this any better because this was literally as good as you could have been, right? I mean, you know, the only thing you can do better is, would be if they would be the same. And then you would have to worry. So actually, I'm not saying this right. I really want this to be bigger because if not, then I actually, you know, if they were the same coefficient, then I'd actually have to worry about all the other stuff. So this is uh, both great timing and terrible timing. It's great because we finished this group. Uh, it's not great because I have one minute and I had so many more things I wanted to tell you. But let me in one minute summarize some of the other things that I wish I had time to do. So. Um, First, can you do better than this? And I told you earlier, no. There are examples of things that are F pure for which you really cannot do any better. This is the Harborn's conjecture is the best possible scenario. If you want to prove something for all ideals that define F pure. But if you restrict the class of F pure to strongly F ideal, you're going to exclude things like square free monomial ideals, but you're still going to keep interesting things like Veronese's and human antle rings. Um, and you can do better. What Craig and I showed is that when R mod I is strongly F regular, let me at least write that out. And I think you've seen the definition of strongly F regular, so I'm not going to write it. This is in the same paper. It proves that if R mod I is strongly F regular, let me write a mysterious statement. Can replace H by H minus one. So, I satisfies Harborn's conjecture, but it's going to behave as if its big height is one less than what it actually is. So you're going to get 
i like to the h minus one and minus h minus one plus one contain an i to the n which looks awful but there are ways of rewriting this that don't look awful i'm just like literally writing hard ones and putting in h minus one where h is three but notice this is a corollary what happens when h is two this is a really great question to ask the audience to end but um it's very dangerous to do this in a Zoom call, so I'll tell you. <laughs> what happens when H is two is you plug in ones where these H's are, and you end up proving that the H, the N symbolic power is contained in the N power. So you prove equality. And there are plenty of ideals defining it through rings of um, uh, big height to that are not um, generated by regular sequences. So this equality doesn't follow from any elementary facts about symbolic powers. This gives you new things um, where you have this equality. We could also have talked a little bit about what happens when your ring is not right there. Um, but I really am out of time. Um, so I think I'm going to have to stop there. So thank you for your attention. All right, thank you so much for the beautiful talks. Are there any questions? Uh, hi, Eloisa, I had a question. Yeah. Um, so most of the containment problem revolved around uh, ideals in a regular. The problems around ideals what? Sorry, can you repeat? Uh, most of the containment problems revolved around uh, radical ideals in a regular way which either define FPO or, or strongly F regular singularities. Do the, does the containment problem become completely intractable if we move away from regular rings to say Gorin's, say taking ideals in a Gorenstein ring or, or a ring defining a, 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 a good singularity? Yeah, very good question. So can we study things like Harbin's conjecture of the containment problem when your ring is not regular? So there are many obstacles that one faces, right? We, we use regularity in sort of essential ways in various cases. Um, one big question that is open and that I think would be really beautiful to answer is the problem. And, and maybe that's the that explains how hard the problem is uh, more, more generally. So when I told you this beautiful theorem, I made a comment, the big theorem that we started from. I made a comment that this says in particular that you can take this constant instead of h, you can take the dimension of r. Like you lose best possibleness for all ideals, but now you have a statement that works for every ideal and it does not depend on r. So one problem that is open is um, if you take a, a ring that is not regular, say a I don't know, complete local domain, and say you focus just on prime ideals, is there a constant d? for which this happens for all prime ideals and for all n. A constant that doesn't depend on the prime you're considering. That's an open question in general. It's, it's proved that such a D exists in some special classes, um, especially by, by work of various people, but especially by work of Hunicky, Katz, and Validasi, and Hunicky and Katz. They have various results of that. Now, some of the results, they're not even constructive, right? They're not finding this one some constant. They're saying that one exists that is independent of I. So a different kind of question is, can you find Swenson's constant explicitly? So one thing I didn't have time to discuss, but it discuss a little bit in the notes, is that um, there's a different proof of this theorem using test ideals and characteristic P and multiplier ideals and characteristic zero. Uh, and if you follow along with that proof, it sort of depends on essential properties of test ideals or multiplier ideals. And there's some work, um, in particular by Daniel Smokin and uh, Javier Cavajar Jocas, where they um, sort of examine that proof and examine the one fact that really, really needs a regular ring. The rest of it works over strong way of regular ring. Diagonally of regular. That's right. They define something called diagonally of regular uh, rings, where they can do a sort of a different proof that still works. And they actually end up proving this exact same result. So for primes, they prove you can take this once and constant to be the height. 
over this diagonally affected regions. So for example, that includes um, the, the, the hypersurface defined by the maximal minors of a two by two matrix, for example. And that might sound like a simple ring, but that was open for a long time, finding this, this constant for, for primes in that ring. So it's, it gets really tricky. Another thing you can do is you can also study things like Harborn's conjecture, right? You can say, okay, maybe, can I, first of all, can I do better than HM? Like, is this sort of Harborn like statement the best thing to do? And at the same time, you can try to find sort of the, you know, a good, good Swanson constant that works. So in particular, this theorem that we proved in the second half, this theorem of myself and, and Craig Unity, this required the ring to be regular. And the main point was that we were using, okay, we were using some of these containments that use regularity somehow. But on top of that, we were using Fetter's criteria. Fetter's criterion gives you a, a criterion for an ideal to define an FQ ring, but the ambient ring should be regular. So if you want to prove a version of this theorem over rings that are not regular, you need a fetter like criterion, right? Over rings that are not regular. So with, um, with Lynch, Roman, and Carl Tweed, uh, we have a paper where we prove a theorem like this, where our rings are Gornstein, and we prove a, a sort of a fetter like criterion for Gornstein rings, but there's the catch. We still need our ideals to have finite projective dimension. And it is not just, so the final projective dimension comes in in several ways, but in particular, our better criterion really requires final projective dimension on the ideas. Um, but in particular, I think that's a criterion that, that possibly has other applications, you know, besides the world of symbolic values. So this is a very long answer to your question. This is to say, like, there, there is something one can do. The problem can still be attacked outside of regular rings, but it's just much more difficult. And um, it's still exciting, I think. And I think in particular, there's more than characteristic P techniques can do for the problem. Um, but I think we're just starting to, to scratch the surface. Are right, any other questions? Well, if not, let's thank uh, Luisa again for the beautiful talks. And now on uh, Monday, Vaiba is going to tell us about the, the problems in the problem set that are already posted, I believe. Uh, yes, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah, so why we are not uh, considering about the uh, something similar questions like the symbolic for every n, the symbolic power of i, uh, there exists a m such that that um, it's content inside i to the power, normal power, i to the power of mn. Uh -huh. So, yeah, hello. So let's see if I, if I understand your question. Is your question about when does there? No, uh, Yeah, so, uh, so here we are considering about um, only suppose for every n, um, so large n, the symbolic power of n, when uh, it can, for this n, um, can we say that there exists a mn such that uh, the symbolic power of n is contained inside the normal power of mn? Oh, you mean backwards? Backwards, yes. So when you do this backwards, it becomes really easy because the end power is always containing the end symbolic power. This is always true, always. And then of course you can now make this guy bigger or make this guy smaller and you keep the container. No, I am saying that uh, symbolic power of I, that content inside that normal power of MN. So for every N, like is this. it possible? Yes, yes, yes. For Abrian, is it, uh, is there, uh, can, uh, is there any question like this? Oh, you mean you want to fix the N instead? Yes. And you're yes. asking, does there exist an N? Now yes, I understand. Yes. Sorry. Aha. So see, a silly thing we could do is we could take this MN to be one, right? So you always have that the N symbolic power is contained in I. So that, that's, that's always true. And so um, 
the thing that is not clear is when you start changing this power here, can you still find the symbolic power to contain it? Does that make sense? So like once you pick this, pick this guy, there's always something to put in here, but it's not very exciting because you can always pick one. So at the end of the day, you can ask, you know, what is the best thing you can put in here? But that's the same thing that we're asking the continuum problem. But asking for existence of something on this side, asking for existence of an MN, then that's easy. The answer is yes, one always exists. No, what is the, I'm asking about the best thing which can. That's right. So that's exactly what the containment problem asks. The containment problem asks for the best possible thing you want to put. So asking, you know, given N, what is the best possible MN such that this holds? Or asking, given A, what is the best possible, I don't know, FA to put in here? These are equivalent questions, right? So um, asking this for, for like, ah, aha. Okay, but maybe, now, now maybe I understand your question a little better. Maybe you're saying, okay, but we're putting like some funky functions here. What if this guy is not a funky function? What am I gonna put in here? But in the end, it's sort of still equivalent, right? Because so for example, when I prove statements like this, this is kind of saying that if you want something, maybe I should be using a different letter, right? Maybe let me use A. This is kind of saying, it's giving me this continuum. So in fact, this is equivalent to this. Whereas um, the naive speak theorem we started from is kind of equivalent to this. And this somehow should make the problem seem even sillier, right? Because it seems like there should be a very short difference between these two, right? Taking a ceiling or taking a floor it seems almost the same. Um, but it really, oh, this is not how I want to write it. I'm writing these backwards, right? Sorry about that. Aha, taking a ceiling or taking a floor, it feels really similar. <laughs> but the truth is that there is a massive difference between these two when you think about the problem from this perspective. So yes, the, the, the containment problem is also asking the same thing that you're asking it, but then you have to sort of switch around how you write these containments. So if you play with these, you'll see, you'll see what I'm saying. If these two are equivalent. Good question. Okay. I mean, we can also stop the recording and if somebody wants to ask more questions, I can stay here and answer more questions.